I'm Doug Ferrer, and this is The World Unpacked. All around the world, democracy is under attack. Will we allow the backward slide of rights and democracy to continue unchecked? Democracy is in retreat as autocrats are back in charge around the world. But the 21st century autocrat is a different breed, deploying subterfuge and force in equal measure to give the veneer of legitimacy over a grab for power. Joining me today to talk about this new autocrat and his new book, The Revenge of Power, is Moises Naim, an acclaimed columnist and distinguished fellow at the Carnegie Endowment. Here we go. Moises, welcome to the show. Hi, Doug. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to talk about your book today. But before we dive into the, the substance of the book, can you just tell me a little bit about why you decided to write this book at this point? Um, nine years ago, I published a book titled The End of Power that examined the forces that were fragmenting and dispersing and therefore diluting power around the world. And in all, all activities, human activities where power mattered, power had become easier to acquire, harder to use, and easier to lose. Uh, but in the nine years that uh, has, in these last nine years, a lot has happened. Um, we have seen the uh, emergence of all kinds of autocrats that are playing by a different playbook that uh, retains uh, and does a gr makes a retains and makes a great effort at looking democratic, but in fact uh, is uh, highly autocratic and uh, undermines uh, the checks and balances that define democracy. It's stealthy, it has international alliances, is many, uh, in many instances is highly criminalized. So there was a lot going on that I felt needed to be uh, examined. So this new book is about the forces that concentrate power, the centripetal forces, if you will. So if the end of power was about the centrifugal forces that dispersed uh, power. This is about the centrifugal forces that concentrate it. And it's the interaction of the two that uh, interests me because uh, it's not either or. We will continue to have uh, very active uh, trends uh, and we co will continue to have very powerful trends that dilute power. But at the same time, those who have power are not taking that those forces stand, you know, sitting down. They're reacting. They're countervailing, they are changing tactics in order to limit uh, the, 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 the degrading, decaying effects of the forces that are diluting power. In your new book, you basically say that the 21st century has seen the rise of a new kind of autocrat. What's different about them from the last century? Uh, there are several things. Well, the first and foremost, of course, technology and, uh, you know, social media and everything else uh, has changed uh, a lot of uh, has altered the politics in, in very profound ways. The stealthiness, there's a lot of stealth uh, uh, in what they're doing and the way in the past, dictators and autocrats were sh shameless. They were just uh, in your face. Here, and uh, perhaps Victor Urban you know, of Hungary is a very good example in which he is an autocrat. He has undermined checks and balances, but he goes out of his way uh, to, to say or to show that uh, there is still uh, vestiges of uh, uh, democracy in, in Hungary. So stealthiness is a very important one, technology is another, and, uh, and the globalization of polarization is a very important uh, uh, aspect because it, it, it creates conditions for these new autocrats uh, to gain power and retain it indefinitely. In your book, you say that the 21st century autocrat uses the three Ps to gain power and give their power a sense of legitimacy. What are those three Ps? The three Ps stand for populism, polarization, and post-truth. Populism has always existed, very often mistakenly identified as an ideology, but it's just a, a, an old strategy of divide and conquer, divide society in order for you to retain, gain and retain power. Polarization has always existed, and it relies essentially on deepening uh, the differences, the, the, the conflicts, the divisions in society. And post-truth existed before as propaganda. 
but is the manipulation of of information to uh, to to support the the autocrats. So I want to touch on each of these, and I want to start with populism. Why are populist autocrats just so popular? Why do people love them so much? Because they tell everyone what they want to hear. They make promises that are going to be unfulfilled, and everybody suspects that they will be unfulfilled, but sounds great because they are willing to to trespass uh, uh, traditional ways of doing things and because they have a long list uh, of tools uh, that they can exploit to gain and retain power. Moving to polarization, you mentioned it's always been with us, but it seems different now or maybe supercharged somehow. Can you talk a little bit about how polarization has changed for the 3P autocrat and how they use it? Polarization now feeds itself uh, from social media and in, in information technologies uh, and all the capabilities that, uh, that, that the internet has created uh, for autocrats. We believe that the internet was going to be a, a technology of liberation, and in many instances it has been, but it also has been a, a technology of repression. And uh, and it is being used to polarize society. And again, it's based on the notion that the more you divide society, the more you can uh, concentrate power and, and retain power. So let's move to post-truth. And uh, living through uh, the Trump presidency certainly has uh, sharpened this point for me as I read your book. But I mean, you said we've had propaganda in the past, and that's certainly true. But it seems like now we're we're self-propagandizing with post-truth. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how this works and how autocrats take advantage of this sort of somewhat new phenomenon? Well, there is the big lie, and there is the myriad small lies, and there is the myriad the stealthy manipulations of the truth and distortions. Uh, and so what we see now, as, as you say, is uh, the popularization of what used to be propaganda. And so now we have millions of uh, propagandists, meaning people that distort the truth and embellish it, distort it, uh, change it, and so on. Um, and so that's, what, that's what's new. Uh, propaganda in the past used to be the, mainly the tool of governments. Uh, Adolf Hitler had the Ministry of Propaganda and Goebbels was the minister famously. Today, China has a ministry of uh, uh, propaganda still. So it was always a state-centered uh, activity, uh, propaganda, uh, you know, using information and manipulation to uh, generate support for the regime. Not anymore. Uh, now it has uh, gone public. And as I said, uh, you have uh, uh, activists on the web, on social media that are tools of propaganda or are themselves the originators of uh, of uh, distorted truth uh, that uh, are placed at the service of the of the ideology of the autocrats. D democracy really rests on the good judgment of its citizens, right? Picking between possible leaders based on policies, being rational. But in your book, you argue that there's been a big growth in something called fandom, where there's a sort of celebritization of political leaders beyond just policy, but kind of down to sort of a supercharged charisma. Can you talk about that concept a little bit? In the book, I talk about fandom. Um, you know, the notion that you have charisma as a requirement to be politically successful is an old idea. You need a charismatic leader, often a messianic leader, uh, that uh, is a populist that uh, you know promises to to, to protect uh, the interests of, of the noble people, uh, and. Um, the charisma was always there, but now it has uh, changed. It's no longer the link, the emotional link between followers and a politician. It is part. It becomes part of the identity of individuals that uh, identify with that politician with the same enthusiasm, the same commitment uh, as they when they follow a, a sports club. Uh, or um, an artist in which there is something that has to do with an emotional link that includes charisma but transcends it. Uh, and it becomes, you know, where fealty uh, becomes very important, in which identity becomes very important. You acquire a preference for the identity that uh, uh, your political leaders uh, bestow on you. And so identity becomes an indispensable part of fandom. 
And fandom is a new way of linking politicians to their people that supports them. So uh, my wife's family's Catholic and her, my mother-in-law loves John F. Kennedy. I mean, grew up young woman, just started getting involved in politics. He comes uh, into, you know, into politics as a presidential candidate. And, you know, she still bears that just sort of almost, almost a fan like sort of belief in him and his presidency. But but he wasn't an autocrat, an aspiring autocrat. So I guess is is fandom really a new concept or how has it changed now to affect politics differently? Well, think about what John F. K. did not have at the time that is now very common. The demonization of the rivals, the notion that the rivals are not legitimate, they don't even have the right to claim space and political voice. The, that um, the rivals that don't deserve to be taken seriously, they are not even um, compatriots that have a different uh, way of thinking. They are an acceptable segment of society. So demonizing and blaming the opposition for whatever ills uh, our society suffers from uh, is a very important part of fandom. Uh, and you know, just um, demonizing the other and, and, and using polarizations and, and, and post-truth to, to separate people, to create wedges, to import problems that create divisions, even if they don't belong in that society or were never present before in that society. I want to ask about your own experience with a 3P autocrat. I mean, you're the former Minister of Trade and Industry from Venezuela, and you talk about Venezuela quite a bit in your book. In fact, I would say you think Chavez was sort of a forerunner of this 3P autocrat, maybe one of the original ones. Uh, what what was it like going through that experience? And at what point did you did you sort of realize that he was destined to try to create sort of an autocratic system using these these three Ps? Oh, it was a daily occurrence. What is very interesting uh, in, in the way in which these new autocrats take power uh, and, and, and retain it is not a one event, a one specific discrete event. It's a process. You know, in, in the past, uh, the, the, the grabbing of power was essentially the, the tanks in the streets, the, the soldiers in every corner, airplanes, and, and it was a military operation. It was a very specific one. Um, not now. Now the undermining of power, the taking of power, occurs in daily events, some of them quite obscure, quite opaque, uh, uninteresting, boring, um, very hard to see from the not informed eye. The naked eye doesn't see how very small bureaucratic decisions uh, are in fact undermining checks and balances in significant ways. Uh, and so that, that is a very important difference that uh, the erosion of power uh, takes uh, is a process now more than uh, an event that uh, was common in the past. We've just come through an experience and are continuing to experience our own uh, adventure with uh, want to be 3P autocrat and Donald Trump. Did you think the United States was immune to this effort? And when you saw Donald Trump descend that golden escalator and start to rise in the polls, did you sort of say, oh, no, it's, it's happening again? I never believed that uh, Donald Trump was going to win uh, and become president. So I, I didn't see it coming. But I did see uh, a lot of the behaviors, tricks, tactics, styles, modalities that I had seen before. I kept saying, I, I have seen this movie, uh, except that it was in Spanish when I first saw it. But it's quite staggering. It's quite amazing. And I, I try in the book to show how these very different individuals with completely different background um, end up behaving in very similar ways. In the book, you mentioned plenty of 3P autocrats, Berlusconi, Chavez, Erdogan in Turkey, Donald Trump. But it seems to me that the, the granddaddy of them all is Vladimir Putin. And I'm curious how much you think the growth of 3P autocracy in the 21st century can be linked to Russian activities, active measures, and other sort of interference globally. 
There is some of that, and there is no doubt that um, one of the innovations of uh, Vladimir Putin is uh, having a superpower on the cheap, uh, thanks to technology and cyber uh, potential, cyber tools and cyber uh, weapons, he can sustain and he can project power. Russia can project power around the world at a fraction of what uh, it was, of the cost that it was when you had to deploy uh, all kinds of uh, military equipment and, and soldiers and uh, etc. And, and so one of the things that he has learned is, is that he can have a, an influential presence even in places that are very remote. If there is turmoil in Spain as a result of uh, the, the Catalan revolt, uh, you, you, we, we now know that uh, uh, Russian bots and Russian cyber technology had a presence there. Same in Mexico, same in other places. So, yes, uh, uh, I, I would not say that he was determinant in such faraway places. He was sort of more influential in what it used to be called before the near abroad of the Soviet Union. So he's bent on trying to recover um, this and, and rebuild the, 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 the national structures that define the Soviet Union. But yes, he is a three peak practitioner. He is very clear on that. Um, but um, I would not go as far as saying that, you know, he's uh, uh, omnipresent. In each of these countries, you have individuals um, that are quite uh, committed and effective practitioners of the three peace strategies. How much of a role has the pandemic played in enabling the growth of 3P autocrats around the world? Well, surely it has made it uh, more difficult to govern. Before, before the pandemic, democratic governments around the world were already having people in the streets. They were, there was turmoil around the world. Uh, there was questioning of democracy. The legitimacy had been lost. Uh, and they needed to gain more legitimacy by having a better performance. And that became very hard with the pandemic. The pandemic made governing very difficult. It became very hard to be a popular president or prime minister if you are presiding over uh, the disaster that was the pandemic. And so in general, we don't have very clear, it's too early to declare if uh, democratic governments were better at, at managing the pandemic than autocrats or vice versa. We don't know that yet, but we what we know is that surely it altered the political dynamic in a lot of these countries and included, and, and again, the three Ps are very crucial for the pandemic. It, it helped, you know, populism and the pandemic. We, we saw and we continue to see how populism uh, is uh, using, you know, who would have said that using or not using masks would become a political issue? Uh, and well, it's the division between the noble people and the abusive elites that is forcing them to wear masks when they didn't want, they don't want it, or the vaccines. Um, the polarization that that creates, the second P was firmly there and very important. And of course, uh, we also, the, the, the use of, of lies and truth by, on the part of several presidents, uh, including the very famous uh, example of Donald Trump uh, and the use of uh, all kinds of alternative medicines uh, that were essentially, it was essentially quackery. After the break, I'll ask Moises how we turn this downward spiral towards authoritarianism around. Hey, thanks for listening to The World Unpacked. If you're enjoying the show, leave us a rating and be sure to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. So you say in the book that out-of-touch elites nurture populism, and certainly we've seen that in the United States, and the UK, and elsewhere. This out-of-touch elite provides the pathway for a 3P autocrat to rise up and take power. So is there a better way for societies to tie their elites to the, the sort of noble people? Of course there is. And, and in, in fact, you could even argue that democracies have had a very good performance in comparison to the tragedies uh, that uh, originated with autocratic uh, uh, bad elites. 
So in, in many ways, what's failing is uh, the narrative. It is very clear that the narrative of the three P autocrats have, has gained and it's better, it's more effective, it mobilizes, energizes, and, and, and creates great enthusiasm uh, for them and their ideas. And then fandom, as I called it before, uh, enters into the fray. Uh, but um, so the, the, the liberal of the world need to come up with a better narrative. That better narrative, however, needs to also address some of the issues uh, that are creating deep frustrations among the people and pushing many of them uh, to, the, to, to having illiberal heroes and illiberal uh, uh, ideas that they like. Uh, it is very important to deal with the inequality that has risen after it was rising and uh, it, it became a, a huge problem as, as a result of the crisis of 2007, 2008, um, Inequality is a big issue. Um, corruption is a very big issue too. Um, democracy needs, you know, and, and the whole process, the whole process, the voting processes, the logistics of, of voting needs to be uh, uh, fixed. Uh, access to voting and mobilizing people to vote and educate them, edu educating them educate them and the uses and abuses of uh, social media. All those things need to be part of a, a renewed, a re rethought, re-engineered kind of democracy. One other aspect of the growth of 3P autocrats is the growth of what you call anti-politics. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is? It is a deep conviction that nothing that has to do with power works that uh, the people and institutions that represent the power structure of the present or the past is unacceptable. They are just a bunch of crooks, of liars, of abusers, of uh, 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 people that uh, uh, are not credible. And that comes, uh, you know, it started in Latin America with a phrase, que se vayan todos, throw them all out. I don't want to have anything to do or I don't want them to have anything to do with guiding or ru ruling over the country. And so that's the, and we, and we find it very commonly, you know, uh, Donald Trump who was a, a, a master in using uh, uh, the, the anti-politics, you know, everything that preceded me was uh, uh, terribly bad and uh, uh, it was unacceptable. So, and that is, um, you, you find that in a lot of these movements, uh, you find it in the people in, uh, protesting around the world. They're protesting about what the situation is, but they are also protesting against uh, uh, politics as usual. So how do we, how do we fight against anti-politics? I mean, it's one thing to make a case for democracy against autocracy, but to convince someone that they should care is, is difficult. Can you, can you give some suggestions on how we might go about doing that? Yeah, there are no silver bullets. Uh, and in the, in the book, I offer some suggestions about what to, to, to do. It all starts with uh, persuading people, not about an ideology, uh, but about uh, um, freedom about the freedom to vote, freedom to exist, freedom to work. Um, the cause of freedom has to become the center of all of these, uh, you know, anti-politics cannot include uh, doing away with freedom and democracy. Those are two things that need to be protected and enhanced and explained and, uh, and emphasized. And uh, only after you have deep commitments to freedom and democracy can you can start building the logistics of democracy. I want to read you a line from your book about post-truth. You say, post-truth is not about the spread of this lie or that lie, but about destroying the possibility of truth in public life. It is terrifying to think that we can't have a basic set of facts that we can agree on from which we can make policies or have disagreements. So what are your ways for democracies to fight the phenomenon of post-truth? Well, I believe, for example, that in terms of uh, fake news and all the manipulation of information, we will see some progress in years to come. There will be innovations in uh, uh, legislation, in technology, uh, in education, uh, that will make it uh, easier for people uh, to avoid the biggest impact of uh, the manipulation that we now see. So I am optimistic from in, in that sense. 
Uh, and I am also optimistic that uh, uh, at some point, as what, what I just said, uh, the post-truth cannot and should not negate uh, the qualities and, uh, of freedom and democracy that have, have to be the guiding forces around uh, which everything else uh, aligns. One of the most important battles that democracy lovers around the world need to fight is the one against the so-called big lie. What is the big lie and how do we fight it? Yes, politicians always lie. Sometimes big lies, sometimes you know small lies, but it's part of the story. It's part of being politicians. You embellish, you distort, you change, you omit. That's part of, uh, of the toolkit. But then now there are the big, big uh, uh, lies. Brexit, for example. Brexit, which uh, separated uh, the United Kingdom from Europe, was built on lies, on statistics and data that were false, on negating and... Uh, uh, debasing the statistics and the studies and the evidence that was correct, uh, is negating reality by undermining the truth. The same is happening with uh, Trump and the big, what he calls a big lie. Uh, so one, never, one of those, at this point in the United States, you don't know if the big lie is the one that uh, Trump is, is, is uh, uh, spreading or what uh, the opponents of Trump are uh, are supporting. So the big lie, and, and you know, and that's unacceptable. The sh societies have to find a way uh, of uh, limiting big lies and increasing the costs and risk of lying. What has happened, and the main problem that we have, is that lying is no longer risky and is no longer politically expensive. And so we need to increase, to heighten the costs of lying. And that is very important. I need to ask why these new 3P autocrats are so interested in legitimacy. You said they could roll tanks down the street in the past and they would put people in labor camps and they would seize power and that would be bad. But now these, these autocrats just seem so desperate to appear legitimate. What, what's, what gives? So let's start with data. Data shows that democracy and the support for democracy and democracy in countries has been declining over the last 15 years or so. There's been less of the democracy. But then there is also a boom in elections. There are elections everywhere. The number of elections, you quantify it, and I did the research recently. If you quantify the elections for prime minister, president, uh, senator, governor, uh, state and local politicians, they're soaring everywhere, every day, around the world, there are elections. So how could it be that uh, a, a demo, a, a autocrat likes so much elections? Why? How do you reconcile elections with autocracy? Well, the answer is, and you alluded to it in your question, is legitimacy. Legi legitimacy is what the, the people that are ruled give to the ruler to govern them. And there are two types of legitimacy, origin legitimacy and performative legitimacy. Origin is that, you know, you have been elected and that gives you the legitimacy to govern. Uh, those uh, it, it, your citizens, but then there is another uh, source of legitimacy, which is good performance. We already established that in these days, good performance is very hard to have. Very rarely governments have a, 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 a you know a, a kind of performance in so many different areas that will increase their legitimacy. In fact, legitimacy uh, of that kind is declining. So they need to find some way of showing that they are legitimate because of their origin. And so they set up and create all kinds of, uh, uh, of events that are electoral events that try to show that, they are, uh, they, that these are electoral free and fair elections, but in fact, they're sham elections. Uh, and so what we're seeing around the world is a proliferation of, of, of very, very um, fraudulent elections. Uh, or you see governments doing the contortions that uh, we saw in Russia between then President Putin and Medvedev, uh, uh, his prime minister at the time. Uh, Putin was term, term limited. And so what they did is that they just shuffled uh, their respective positions uh, and uh, 
uh, and run the country and won the election and run the country but where everybody knew that Putin was had not relinquished power. Putin was continued to be in power, but they used these contortions. Just and what? Why was that? Because they were looking for legitimacy. At the end of the section in your book where you write about COVID, you say there's one possible future where COVID is remembered as the moment when the world turned the corner on the new 3P autocrats. And if within a few years it becomes clear that the countries that honored scientific expertise and the free flow of information outperformed those remain, remaining committed to post-truth, then the legitimacy of these know-nothing autocrats will have suffered a severe blow. I have to read that because most of a book about revenge of power is pretty scary stuff, but are you hopeful for the future? Is this a possible turning point? Yeah, I do believe that at the end, truth will prevail, uh, that um, you know the autocrats are not going to do a better job um, in battling the pandemics or other challenges ahead. And that uh, democracy, in that, in that aspect, democracy will prove far superior. Moises, thank you for coming on to discuss your new book, The Revenge of Power, How Autocrats Are Reinventing Politics for the 21st Century. And I urge all of you who are listening to go out and buy a copy. It's available now, and we'll make sure that uh, links to buy it are in the show notes. Moises, thanks a lot. Thank you, Doug. This was a great conversation. And thank you very much for your support for my book. Hey, thanks so much for listening. We want to hear from you, so email us at podcasts at ceip.org. And you can find me on Twitter at Douglas L. Farrer. That's F-A-R-R-A-R. If you like the show, please hit that subscribe button and leave us a review or a rating. The World Unpacked is produced by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Our audio engineer is Tim Martin, and our executive producers are Cliff Jayapranata and Clarissa Guerrero.